world. Let us now consider the second Kantian idea, the idea of world. Kant argues that this idea, like the idea of the self, is a product of reason attempt to unify appearances into a totality. The idea of the self, however, arises from reason's attempt to unify the objects of inner sense, and that is, the states of our own consciousness. The idea of the world, by contrast, unifies the objects of outer sense, spatial temporal objects, or in other words, physical things. Since space and time are the forms of sensible intuition, all objects of the outer sense are given as extended in space and time. But in encountering particular spatial temporal objects, we inevitably try to go beyond them. We form the idea of a totality of such objects, that is, of all particular physical things thought of as a whole. We are inevitably tempted to think that if the condition is given, the entire sum of conditions, and consequently the absolute uncondition, is also given. We therefore conceive of particular appearances as belonging to a totality, and as a given idea against the backdrop of this totality. This totality, the world, is the idea of the absolute unity of a series of conditions of appearances. It lets us think of our experiences of particular spatial temporal objects as unified, as making up an absolute totality in the synthesis of appearances. But like all self that underlies all objects of inner sense, the world is not an object of possible experience. We never do and never could encounter the entire sum of conditions, so we can know nothing positive about such totality. But this has not stopped philosophers from trying to demonstrate certain facts about the world without, uh, about the world using reason alone. Accordingly, most of Kant's discussion of this idea is devoted to showing that any attempt to know the world theoretically involves fallacious reasoning. It leads to antinomies, inconclusive debates between the two positions that are incompatible but equally plausible. For example, if we ask wh whether the world is finite or infinite in space and time, we find equally compelling arguments on both sides. Reason can prove both that the world has a beginning in time and is also limited as regards space, and that the world has no beginning and no limits in space. Such antinomies are a sign that reason has overstepped its bounds. Kant argues that the proper response to them is not to endorse either side of the debate, but to reject the premise shared by both. What Henry Allison calls the initially plausible but ultimately incoherent conception of the sensible world as a whole existent in itself. But while we must reject the assumption that the sensible world is an object of possible experience, we must also recognize the idea that the world plays an indispensable regulative role. Conceiving of physical things as part of, of a whole helps make our experience of them systematic. Consequently, we must also view spatial temporal objects as if they belong to a totality. Even if we recognize that this totality could never be given as the objects are. Hegel is sharply critical of Kant's approach to the idea of the world. He agrees that his ideas plays a crucial role in regulating experience and that we must see spatial temporal objects as belonging to a larger whole. Unlike Kant, however, he believes that reason can demonstrate certain things about this whole. According to Hegel, the reason that Kant is unable to say anything positive about the world is that Kant understands this idea in an excessively abstract way. Kant divorces this idea from all content, viewing it as nothing more than an empty principle of totality. Hegel claims that it is the abstractness of this approach, and not the notion of worldhood as such, that leads to antinomies. So while we must, in Hegel's view, make use of the idea of the world, it is above all necessary not to cling to the abstract determinations of the understanding as if they were ultimate as if each of the two terms of an antithesis could stand on its own. But this, he claims, is precisely what Kant's cosmological discussions do. They, therefore, miss the phenomenon of the world.
According to Hegel, instead of abandoning the attempt to know the world theoretically, we should approach this idea in a way that transcends the one-sidedness of the abstract determinations of the understanding. This means viewing the world dialectically, since dialectical thought alone can grasp its opposed aspects as moments of something fluid. It also means seeing the world as a concrete whole, not according to abstract determinations. To understand the world concretely is to say that the backdrop of our experiences of spatial temporal objects is not an empty principle of totalization, but has specific content. For Hegel, this content is described by his theory of objective spirit. Objective spirit plays much of the same role in Hegel, it's thought that the idea of the world plays in Kant. It lets us see particular spatial temporal objects as belonging to a larger context. But this larger context takes a number of concrete forms, natural phenomena, historical events, and particular social and political institutions. The objective world, Hegel maintains, has distinction in it. As objective world, it falls apart inwardly into an undetermined manifoldness. And each of these isolated bits is also an object or something there that is inwardly concrete, complete and independent. Moreover, Hegel's theory of objective spirit gives a comprehensive account of how these different forms are related. It explains why objective spirit must take the particular form it does. It also explains how these forms evolve with one form giving rise to another in a necessary order. In short, the theory of objective spirit allows Hegel to claim not just that particular objects are given as particular of a whole, but that the true is the whole. And it allows him to see this whole as something concrete. What would Recur make of these approaches? He would surely agree that the idea of the world plays a crucial role in regulating experience. He would grant that our experiences of particular spatial temporal objects are always given against the water context. And it is philosophy's task to shed light on this context. From the beginning of his career, Recur works has explored the large context in which human experience unfolds, nature, history, and political communities, for example. He has also frequently claimed that we cannot do without the unity provided by such contexts, and that our experiences of a spatial temporal objects are intelligible only when seen as elements of a larger whole. Time and narrative, for example, argues that we cannot experience an object as temporal unless we situate it in a narrative, that time becomes human time to the extent that it is organized after the manner of a narrative. Recur would also agree with Hegel that Kant's view of worldhood is too abstract, too independent on empty dualisms. Our account of the world must therefore be made concrete by given a specific content. The unequal genius of Hegel, Recur claims, is to have employed the Darles de Long with unprecedented richness, exhibiting our historical experience in all its social, political, cultural, and spiritual dimensions. But it is also clear that Recur would be uneasy with some of the claims Hegel makes about the content, this content. He would be uncomfortable with Hegel's theory of objective spirit, seeing it as a unacceptably totalizing. In Recur's view, Hegel tends to hypostatize, hypostatize, hypostatize objective spirit. He tends to claim that the collective entity described by the theory of objective spirit, for example, the state and the movement of history, are more real than the individuals that compromise them. In this view, an individual human being is a sort of abstraction. It has less reality and perhaps less importance than the wholes of which it is a part. Recur finds this consequence unacceptable. He therefore distances himself from Hegel's account in the world as well as from Kant's. Quote, the point of which the Hegelian attempts to become, in my mind, a temptation to be vigorously avoided is this. One can fundamentally doubt whether in order to be elevated from the individual to the state, it is necessary to distinguish ontologically, ontologically between subjective spirit and objective spirit, or rather between consciousness and spirit, end quote. <laughs> 
What would it mean to refrain from distinguishing ontologically between subjective spirit and objective spirit? It would involve putting individual human beings and their acts at the center of our understanding of the world. It would mean insisting that the collective entities described by Hegel's theory of objective spirit, the state, for example, may always be reduced to individuals and explained in terms of them. On this view, collective entities such as the state are products of composition. They are constituted through the acts of individuals and have no reality apart from these acts. Ricard is led to this approach by his views on the philosophy of action. It is part of the minimal criteria of human action, he argues, that we, we are that we be able to identify this action through the projects, intentions, and motives of agents capable of imputing their action to themselves. In other words, it must be possible to describe an action accurately using terms that the agent performing the action will recognize and accept. But when we view individuals as abstract determinations of some hypostatized collective entity, we describe their actions in terms they would not recognize or accept. For example, in terms of a cunning reason that puts the individual to work for itself. In doing so, we let these minimal criteria be abandoned. And we begin to hypothesize, hypothesize social and political entities to raise power to the heavens and to tremble before the state. Recur also seems to have ethical reasons for favoring an account based on composition. One may wonder, he says, whether Hegel's hypothesis of spirit elevated in this way above individual consciousness and even above intersubjectivity is not responsible for another hypothesis, that of the state itself. It is a short leap from the claim that the state is somehow more real than individuals to the conclusion that individuals have less value or importance than the state. Footnote 44. And it is hard to dismiss or curse worry given passages such as the following from Hegel's philosophy of history. Quote, in contemplating the faith which virtue, morality, and even piety experience in history, we must not fall into the litany of lamentations that the good and pious often, or for the most part, fare ill in the world, while the evil disposed and wicked prosper. Speaking of something which in and for itself cons constitutes a name of existence, that so-called well or ill-faring of these, of these or those isolated individuals cannot be regarded as an essential element in the rational order of the universe, end quote. And footnote. Two, the extent that our account of worldhood refers to a collective entities, it must reduce these entities to a network of interactions. In Ricard's view, the philosopher who has articulated the most promising account of this sort is Husserl. Comparing Hegel's and Husserl's views on social phenomena, recur muses, quote, if one refuses to have hypothesized objective spirit, then one has to explore the other alternative in death. Mainly, it must always be possible, according to Husserl's work in hypothesis in the fifth Cartesian meditation, to generate all the higher level communities, such as the state, solely on the basis of the constitution of others in an intersubjective relation. All the constitutions have to be derivative. First, those of the common physical world, then those of the common cultural world, conducting themselves in their turn in relation to one another as higher order selves confronting others of the same order. End quote. The task is to combine the best parts of Hegel's account of worldhood with Husserl's reliance on composition. We must conceive of the world as made concrete in collective entities such as history and the state. But if we are to avoid hypothesizing these entities, we must see them as constituted by individual agents all the way down. It is not surprising, surprising then that Ricoeur's account of the world owes a great deal to phenomenological discussions of this idea, as well as to Kant's and Hegel. Phenomenological accounts of the world typically see it not as a thing, much less a thing that is more real than any individual, 
but as a web of meanings essentially linked to subjectivity. For phenomenological thinkers such as Dan Zahavi put it, the world is not something that simply exists. The world appears and the structure of this appearance is conditioned and made possible by subjectivity. Husserl certainly conceives of the world in this way. In early texts such as The Ideas, he describes it as an environment or setting in which consciousness finds itself situated. In his later work, talk of the sort is replaced by talk of the life world, that is the pre-theoretical sphere that always precedes reflection and that can never be fully thematized. But in all of these discussions, Husserl resists thinking of the world as a mind-independent object. The world is always the world that appears to some conscious subject, and no other sort of world is even imaginable. The attempt, Husserl writes, to conceive of the universe of true being as something lying outside of the universe, of possible consciousness, possible knowledge, possible evidence, is nonsensical. They belong together, essentially. Heidegger develops a similar but even more radical account of worldhood. Of course, Heidegger no longer speaks of a world constituted by subjectivity, preferring instead of to speak of Dasein, but it's just as hostile as Husserl to the claim that the world is a thing or an object. Heidegger, Heidegger conceives of a world as that wherein a factical Dasein as such can be said to live. Dasein's world is a set of meaning relation that links it to other entities. My pen and my desk, for example, are given as equipment that I may use in my various practical projects. They therefore refer back to me and have specific meanings in virtue of the role they play in my existence. My world is the totality of such meanings. So for Heidegger, as for Husserl, the world is a structure of meanings constituted by the acts of a subject, or in Heidegger's case, by something like a subject. Like Kant and Hegel, these thinkers insist that spatial temporal objects are always encountered against the backdrop of a larger context. Unlike Kant and Hegel, however, they see this context as dependent on the meaning given acts performed by a subject. These phenomenological understandings of the world show recur a strategy for thinking about this idea, a strategy that will meet the demands of this post Hegelian Kantianism. Following Husserl and Heidegger, Kerr will conceive of the world as a set of meanings disclosed or opened up by the subject. He will, however, take special care to show that, is, that this set of meanings is concrete without being totalizing. Ricoeur's most explicit discussion of worldhood appears in his writings on narrative from the 1970s and the 1980s. In Time and Narrative, as well as in a number of essays dealing with related themes, Ricoeur offered the idea of the world as a way of thinking about the relation between narrative and reference. Ricoeur is adamant that narratives refer to reality. Contrary to certain developments in recent French philosophy, he insists that there is a horse text. But in the case of narrative, the notion of reference must be separated from the limits of ostensive reference. Narratives refer to reality, but they do not simply point out some aspect of reality that exists independently of them. They refer to something beyond the sense of the work, something that is merely described by the narrative in question. Ricoeur calls this something a world. He claims, for example, that the type of reference affected by narrative is a second order reference, which reaches the world not only at the level of manipulated objects, but at the level that Husserl designed, designated by the expression Lebenswelt and Heidegger by the expression being in the world. In other words, narrative refers not to specific objects or state of affairs, but to the context or meaning networks in which objects and state of affairs are encountered. These networks are worlds in the phenomenological sense of the term. Ricard elaborates on his claim as follows. Quote, For us, the world is the ensemble of references opened by the text. Thus, we speak about the world of Greece, not to designate any more what we were 
the situations of those who lived them, but to designate the non-situational references that outline the effacement of the first and that henceforth are offered as possible modes of being, as symbolic dimensions of our being in the world. For me, this is the reference of all literature, no longer the unwelt of the ostensive references of dialogue, but the welt projected by no ostensive references of every text that we have read, understood, and loved. End quote. Note recurs mention of the non situational references. Narr narratives refer to the past or present state of affairs. Situations but to something that is projected or opened up by them. Specifically, a narrative project's possible modes of being for its reader, symbolic dimensions of the reader's being in the world. It refers to ways in which the reader might exist, and it refers to them by uncovering them, showing them to us for the first time. A narrative reference is a proposed world, and I couldn't have it and wherein I could project one of my own most possibilities. In some ways, Recurse points, Recur's point is a simple one. When I read a story, I make sense of it by appropriating it, bringing it to bear on my own situation. Recur follows Gadamer in claiming that understanding is completed in application and that to understand a text is to let it speak to something specific in me, to allow it to fuse with the horizons of my existence, as Gadamer would say. This is, first and foremost, a matter of seeing how possibility described in the text might manifest itself in my own existence, and this, in turn, is a matter of imagining ways in which I might act out the existential possibilities described by the text. In reading Hamlet, for example, I see the protagonist wrestle with the reality and the inevitability of death. I watch as Hamlet is paralyzed by this insight, but ultimately accepts it and learns to act in the face of it. Ultimately, understanding Hamlet is a matter of asking whether this insight should be incorporated into my own existence and of imagining the different ways in which it might be. It involves experiencing the text as issuing a challenge to me, a challenge that I might accept, reject, or dismiss, and that in any case I respond to by existing. And there then refers not the, to something actual, but to a possible way of existing. Surely this is what Recur has in mind when he says that to understand is not to project oneself into the text, but to expose oneself to it. It is to receive a self enlarged by the appropriation of the proposed world that interpretation unfolds. Gerald Bruins calls this view a magical looking glass theory of textual meaning. For Recur, a narrative is a magical looking glass in the sense that it lets us see a potential mode of our own existence that would otherwise have remained invisible. Bruno deliberates on Ricoeur's view as follows. Quote, Texts mean not by corresponding to the state of affairs, not by satisfying truth conditions, but by manifesting or opening up a region of existence whose reality is not simply a matter of analysis, but is, on the contrary, a matter for appropriation, for intervention and action. The task of discourse in this sense would be no merely to, to picture reality, but to throw light on the situation in which we find ourselves historically and open up a path for us to follow in the way of action and conduct, end quote. In short, a region's existence whose reality is a matter of appropriation is what recur, call, recur means by world. But Recur's magical looking glass theory is richer and more complex than it first seems. For a cur, the world is not just an idea connected with the interpretation of, write, of written texts. It is of much broader significance because for a cur, the notion of narrative is of much broader significance. Written texts are not the only sorts of narratives. In fact, it is misleading to use the term narrative at all since it suggests that the sorts of structures found in written and spoken stories are found only there. Recur denies this and he puts it in this way. Quote, I fight against the claim that texts constitute by themselves a world or a closed world. It is only by methodological decision that we say that the world of literature, let us say, constitute a world of its own. It is only in libraries that texts are closed on themselves, and even then only when nobody reads them. So, then, we have an, 
a closed world of text in the library, but literature is not a big library. It is by the act of reading that I follow a certain trajectory, a trajectory of meaning of the text. Then, re then I reenact in a certain sense the dynamic course of the text, and I prolong this dynamic beyond the text itself." End quote. The narrative function is to use Gadamer's phrase, universal in scope. Narration, the process of situation objects into organized structures with beginning, middles, and ends, is a general feature of human awareness. As we have already seen in time and narrative, argues that it is through narrative that we experience time to the extent that we can. And to experience an object as temporal just is to situate it in some narrative structure. Time becomes human time to the extent that it is organized after the manner of narrative. And as a result, there can be no thought about time without narrative time. Since all human experience unfolds in time, it also involves narrative ordering. Ricoeur therefore denies that time, there is any experience that is not already the fruit of narrative activity. There are also more specific reasons for think, to think that the significance of narrative goes well beyond the spheres of written text. In his essay, The Model of the Text, for example, Ricoeur argues that human action has a narrative structure. Actions display the same essential feature as written texts. They have meanings and, and effects that may escape the intention of the authors and their open works that may be interpreted and reinterpreted by audience of indefinite size and makeup. In this, way, in this way, as well, narrative structure is a pervasive feature of human experience. It follows that the opening up of worlds through narrative is also a pervasive feature of human experience. Since we are always narrating, we are always disclosing new worlds, new networks of meanings that act as backdrops for the objects of experience. For Kerr, as for Kant and Hegel, we are always unifying experience by situating its elements in the context of a world. Ricoeur simply has a different view of what sort of context a world, a world is. Despite appearances, to the contrary then, Ricoeur does give a general account of what the world is, the same sort of account offered by Kant and Hegel, though he presents this account through in discussions of literary texts, and though it is heavily influenced by Husserl and Heidegger's phenomenology, it performs the same function as Kant's and Hegel's treatment of his idea. More importantly, for our purposes, it is an account that is both post-Hegelian and Kantian. It is Kantian in the sense of the analytical Kant, in its acknowledgement of the opposition and oppositions and dualisms inherent in the idea of the world. Ricoeur recognizes, for example, that a world is fundamentally different type of phenomena than the particular objects encountered within it. Particular objects are things and are met with inexperience. Worlds are networks of meaning and are the context of experience, experience rather than the possible objects of experience. One second. Recur's account is therefore open to dualisms. Like Hegel, however, Ricoeur tries to overcome these dualisms as much as he can by understanding the world concretely. For Ricoeur, the world is not an empty principle of totality. It is a set of existential possibilities that are disclosed through the application of a narrative to a highly specific situation. Hamlet opens up a world for me when I let it speak to my own situation and my own concerns, ones that might be very different from those of other readers. And the existential possibilities open up in this process that are always my existential possibilities. There is no world in general. There are only concrete worlds disclosed to particular subjects by specific narratives. But Ricoeur's account is concrete without being totalizing, and is therefore meets the requirement of a dialectical Kantianism. It does not totalize because it does not swamp individuals in collective entities that are alleged to be more real or more valuable than they are. In Ricoeur's view, a world is constituted through an act of projection performed by an individual. What is projected in this act does not precede the act or exist independently of it. So while a world may make reference to collective entities, as when a novel asks us to reflect on our relations to society or history, for example, it does not hypothesize these entities. It views them as derivative or as made up of individual acts all the way down. It, is therefore, it therefore leaves ample room for freedom 
and indeterminacy, room for individuals to reimagine society and history in new ways. For recur, individuals are never mere puppets of the cunning of reason. Indeed, it is striking that when Recur describes the process of situating objects in a larger context, he takes a great care to show that these contexts are concrete, but not totalizing. A good example is his discussion of tradition. Like most hermeneutical philosophers, Recur argues that belonging to a tradition helps make thought possible. That as Gadamer says, being situated within an event of tradition a process of handing down is a prior condition of understanding. Individual thinkers must situate, must situate themselves within a tradition by identifying, it, identifying with it and adopting some attitude towards it. This process is one of, one of the concrete ways in which one relates one's experiences to a larger context. Furthermore, it is a process that opens up a world for the individual in question. To identify with a tradition is above all to uncover certain existential possibilities for oneself. The possibility of endorsing one's tradition or of rejecting it, for example. At the same time, recur resists thinking of tradition as a collective entity that swallows individuals and tramples their individuality. There is not just one valid tradition. The fact that we must situate ourselves in some tradition or other does not mean that any single tradition trumps all others. Kerr is careful to distinguish traditionality or need to belong to some tradition or other from traditions or the particular cultural heritages to which we might belong. The former concept is the transcendental for thinking about history, but its transcendental status implies nothing about the legitimacy or illegitimacy of any particular tradition. Kerr also insists that even particular traditions are not monoliths that merely constrain individuals. They are constituted through the acts of individuals, and their reality is derivative. Before being an inert deposit, Ricoeur says, tradition is an, open, is an operation that can only make sense dialectically through the exchanges between the interpreted past and the interpreting present. He's even more adamant about this when discussing particular communities and concrete traditions. When discussing the future of Europe, for example, he insists that the identity of a group, culture, people, or nation is not of an immutable substance, nor that of a fixed structure, but that rather of a recounted story. As a result, a tradition remains living only if it becomes to be held in an unbroken process of reinterpretation. It is at this point that the reappraisal, reappraisal of narratives of the past and the plural reading of founding events come into effect. Tradition is a concrete expression of a worldhood, and thus it is something we help shape.